pretend. All righty, so let's, let's do this. All righty. So with my penchant for change, I've often wondered, okay, why do, how do have I stayed so grounded in my faith? I sometimes think I was born loving Jesus, although I'm not sure how or why. My mother had her own church drama uh, and trauma <laughs> on her own and never really sought for us to go to church. Uh, we never read the Bible together. We never prayed openly as a family. However, my mom sat me down when I was about eight or nine years old, and she talked to me about what it means to be baptized. And she asked me, hey, is this something that you would like to do? And I was so excited. I was like, yes, finally, a way to officially show I can be someone special. I can be part of God's family. And so I went to Catholic Sunday school and Wednesday night baptism school for about a month to really, you know, get equipped for the job. And on the day of my baptism, I wore a beautiful white robe, and I carried a tall candle, and I walked down this long aisle in the Catholic church my, my mom had chosen for me, and I remember walking with so much pride that day, like all eyes were on me, because I was about to be someone special. And trust me, this little black girl with a special education plan, who attended six schools by the time she was in the fourth grade, was in need of feeling special. And I remember the priest talking for a long, long time. I don't remember any of his words, but finally, my big moment came. And the priest asked me a question or two to confirm that I was, you know, strong in my Bible knowledge. And then he dipped his finger in holy water and formed a cross on my forehead. And I turned around to face the audience and, you know, received a plight, subdued clapping from that, you know, nice, mild audience. And I walked back to my mother to be seated, and I was like, I is that all? Because I had built up in my head that, like, my baptism was special to God, that something magical would happen. I wanted mystery. I wanted romance. I wanted God to see me. I knew something my mind didn't yet know, that I was born into this world already knowing the world of spirit existed. It was decades before my mind would allow me to access it. So today, I'd like to help us learn how to be people of the spirit. To do that, I'm using a few resources like the Bible, big surprise, right? Also, a book by Marcus Borg called Jesus, A New Vision and a few borrowed thoughts from Deepak Chopra. The first book, um, in the first chapter in the book of Mark, tells us about a much more mystical baptism than mine. It's that of Jesus by John the Baptist. And in Mark 1.8, John declares to the crowd, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it's a clear declaration of two things happening at once. One, the purification of our earthly form. And two, a connection to the spiritual realm. One thing I've always liked about this passage is that John never says when Jesus would baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Do we have to earn the Holy Spirit's presence? Do I need to, like, fill out some paperwork to get on the roster? Like, so when, does it happen the second we're baptized? No. Well, not for us at least, but it was Jesus who had a different experience. See, Mark 1.10 says that as soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at a Starbucks. Yeah, not joking there. It's laughable, though. In 2017, nearly three decades after I was baptized, I was on a deep spiritual journey to seek and know God in a new way. I was reading my Bible in depth daily. I was praying, meditating, participating in two weekly Bible studies. I was on my own way in trying to deconstruct the Jesus that society's religion had taught me and be introduced to the Jesus in my heart. So there I was, sitting at Starbucks, with headphones on, listening to, you know, some light Christian rock. 
reading my Bible intently, when bam, all of a sudden, I felt the weight of the world lift off me. I felt filled with joy, and I was desperate to hold on to that moment. It's never been as intense as that moment. I felt like I needed to stand up and dance. I wanted to sing. I wanted to praise the Lord's name. All this was happening internally, but as I looked around the store, no one was noticing this major change that was happening inside of me. I honestly had no idea what was happening. But I opened my journal, and I began writing praises in my heart. I was crying, but they were the happiest tears of joy and wonder. I finally felt seen by God. I felt special. And over the next few weeks and months, that same feeling stayed with me, but also a few new feelings popped up. I would really feel like I was physically hit when I heard cussing. It made me wince. Cussing has never been a taboo in my world, so this was very confusing to me. I also became very, very clear on who in my life was healthy for me to spend time with, and who was draining to me. And over a period of a few months, I had a few more revelations as well. I also had an overwhelming need to want to help in big ways. I had a daily desire to show up for people. So one day, I went to lunch with two spirit-filled friends. Now, I didn't know know that at the time. Well, I knew they were my friends. I didn't know they were spirit-filled. And I hesitantly started explaining what had been happening to me. So side note, This is a pattern in my life where I am extremely nervous to share anything mystical or otherworldly with anyone. So the fact that I'm on stage being broadcast as I share my story just tells you how deeply the spirit has rooted in me. Anyways, so my friends, as I was telling my story, they both got smiles on their faces, and they were like sharing glances between the two of them, and finally one of them grabbed my hand excitedly and said, Aisha, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, huh? But I was at a Starbucks with a mom bun. No church, no white robe, no holy water, no candle, no nothing. Just me, my Bible, and a latte. Well, actually, latte could be considered holy water sometimes, but in this case, it was latte. And my friends advised me, hey, go talk to your pastor. So I did. And they also advised me, keep digging into those spiritual practices and see where the Spirit would take me. So Jesus realized his mission with his vision at the time of his baptism. The Gospels all point to this point in time as the start of his ministry. Jesus walked through the, remaining of, the remainder of his days with clarity of purpose. He declared he was anointed to preach the good news, to give sight to the blind, and to liberate the oppressed. Jesus declared he was a peacemaker. And in telling us this story, the Bible is also allowing us to access a point of wisdom. There is a spiritual realm in existence. This realm or world of spirit is a hard notion for us contemporary Western culture people to wrap our minds around. The modern world view sees reality as having one dimension, this this visible and very material realm. However, in Jesus' time and for centuries prior, the idea of another layer of reality in addition to this visible one was common knowledge. The two realms were not seen as separate at all, but actually intersecting. So to try to understand the time of Jesus while dismissing the idea of another realm fails us completely to see the phenomena. For many of us, it requires us to to have a temporary suspension of disbelief. Jesus and the disciples and the people of that time had numerous experiences with the world of spirit, and it radically challenges our culture's way of seeing reality. Many of the prophets over the course of the Bible share a common practice of finding times of isolation to meditate and still the mind. Jesus was no different. As you read through his ministry, you almost get the sense that his main source to restore his energy was time alone in deep prayer. 
He even experienced visions during this time, like seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And in the Jewish tradition of, the, of his day, it was common for believers to move past verbal prayer to deep levels of prayer characterized by silence over long periods of time. And in this state, your ordinary consciousness is stilled, allowing you to quietly commune with God. The stilling of the mind was an important spiritual practice for Jesus, and in 2017, it was for me too. One time while I was engaged in deep meditation to the point of not being aware of the actual room I was in, God gave me a vision of my future. The vision was intensely personal, and so I'm not going to share all of it here today, but I want to share a part of it. In 2 Corinthians 12.2, Paul writes about a man he knew who was caught up into the third heaven. I had a similar feeling that day in my, with my vision. I had a spiral sensation of being shot up into the sky, past the earth, into the stars. And then I was walking on one of those flat escalators that you see at DIA, you know? And, the, and, and parts of my life, scenes from my life were just whoo, whoo, flashing by, whoo, whoo, flashing by. And I saw a scene from a traumatic event in my life. And then all of a sudden, I will spiral down back onto earth and reliving that traumatic event. Everything was replaying exactly as it had happened. This was the day that I was in a different country, seated on a bus, stopped at an intersection, and saw a man outside my window. He was on a bike with fruit in the front basket. And as I casually watched him, a semi-truck drove by and hit him. And I saw the whole thing right in front of me. And I've often prayed for this own unknown man and his family, and I've always felt an unbearable heartache when I think of this event. Just as the event was replaying in my vision, I got up off the bus, this happened in real life, and I ran over to the man to try to help. And just as I had done in real life, as I got closer, my worst fears were confirmed as I looked at the damage. And something stopped me physically from getting near him. I was walking and I was stopped. And then the event in my vision started playing over again. What? In my vision, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not watching this replay again. Every part of the replay of the event was exactly like it had happened in the original until the point of contact with the truck and the man. Immediately, there out of the tree line right next to me, I saw Jesus swiftly walking towards the man, not rushing. He bent down over the man, crying. And in the event of the replay, I was approaching the body, came off the bus. When Jesus put his hand out, and no joke, something like a force field went over the body, and it stopped exactly where I physically could not move anymore. And as I was looking at the body in my vision, Jesus looked at me, and in my mind, I heard him say, I will protect you, and I will always be with them. Yeah, so that happened. Then my spirit spiraled back up to the sky, to the stars, and I was back on the flat walking escalator with scenes of my life passing by. Many more things happened in that vision that I'll keep private. But I'll, I tell you the part I do to help you understand that the realm of the spirit does exist in our modern age. And becoming mindful and still is one way that we can access it just like Jesus. Now, Jesus' words from, from the vision have resonated in my heart many times since then. But especially a few years later, when my late husband, Brad, was diagnosed with cancer. Now, it brings me joy, but it also brings me pain to talk about Brad in a public way. But I think he would want me to speak my truth. So, at his passing... I had a vision of Jesus' hands coming out of my bedroom ceiling and picking up Brad 
and I heard those words again. He said them in my head. He said, I will protect you, and I will always be with them. And at that exact time that that happened, the smartwatch on my husband's wrist read no pulse. And at the same time that that happened, my mother, who was in the room with me, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. My mother looked up at the ceiling. And later on, I asked her, what were you looking at? And she said, I don't know. I just felt this like overwhelming calmness come from like above and all over me. And, and she goes, I think Brad's spirit left right then. And my mom and I have never talked about that kind of stuff. Um, her career as a neurological treatment and also a breast cancer diagnostic nurse has unfortunately led her to be in the room of many passings. And she said that she has never felt a soul leave its body, but she was clear that that's exactly what happened that day. And I saw it happen, so I know that's what happened. And it gives me great joy in here because I know exactly where Brad is. I don't ever wonder. I was given a gift through another reality to know exactly where my husband is right now. And I often wish that I lived during the time of Jesus, right, so that I could see a blind person gain sight or a paralyzed man get up, pick up his mat, and walk home, or, or a deceased child of a faithful man be raised from the dead. I wonder, you know, would that scare me? Would it make my faith stronger? Jesus was so clear on his life mission that he didn't hesitate to act on the gifts he was given. Could I be that brave, that courageous, that clear? And then I started wondering, well, are there ripples happening in this day and age between the spiritual realm and the earthly realm that I had previously downplayed or misunderstood in order to make sense of them? But in fact... They were experiences of another reality. Well, in December of 2017, Brad and I were sitting on the couch, cuddled next to each other, and I was reading him a Bible passage. And we'd been discussing and praying the idea of selling our long-term home and moving to another part of the city. We really weren't sure if it was the right thing to do for our family. And as I turned the page in my Bible, kind of this awkward thing happened where I tilted the book, and the whole, this whole chunk of, from a different section just fell out of the Bible. It hit his leg, and it landed on the floor. And I was kind of upset because it was a brand-new Bible. I just paid 45 bucks for it. I was like, oh, uh, this binding is not working for me. But I loved the Bible. So I picked it up. I found the section, and I go to kind of like, you know, stick it back in there. And we both kind of look at it and do a double take. The page that was on the front of the chunk was this beautifully artistic written sentence. The whole page had one sentence on it in a Bible. And it said, the Lord himself will build a house for you. So you know what Brad and I were like. We were like, God's building our house. Whoop, 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 whoop. I hope he's paying for it too. Yeah. So we decided it was a sign, right? We were like, we took the next few months, we readied our house, we to put it on the market. It sold in three days, and we had to be out by the end of the month because the new owner wanted to live in it. <laughs> and honestly, I was so confused by this blessing, though, because no way God had started and finished building our home in a few months. And also, uh, where was our house? because we didn't know where we were living when we closed on our house. We didn't know where we were going. And we decided in our, you know, very omnipresent way of reading his sign that God needed more time. So we just moved to a temporary home, you know, give him about a year to figure things out. We know, you know, God had to play chess with the real estate market to obviously get us our dream home for pennies on the dollar. And we were just going to be patient. So we moved. And four months later, Brad was diagnosed. And a year to the date of the sale of our home, Brad passed away. Much later, I had a dream 
not just any dream, but like one of those dreams where you're like, I think I was really there. I think that actually happened. Like when you wake up and you're like, that wasn't just a dream. Well, in this dream, I visited Brad in heaven. Now, he didn't know I was there, but I got to view his beautiful home in heaven. And I actually watched it being built by Jesus with his own hands. And then I watched Brad take over the carpentry. For those of you that know him, know that he was a woodworker. And he completed his home in heaven. And I heard the words that literally woke me up from that dream. It said, the Lord himself will buy, build a house for you. Oh, so that's what that sign meant. Nothing to do with the real estate market. Nothing to do with this physical realm of existence. Everything to do with Jesus trying to comfort us for what was coming in the spiritual realm. Jesus, as a man, was aware of the spiritual power flowing through him. When he would heal or cast out demons, he would do so verbally saying, by the spirit of God, Jesus was a confirmed wonder worker. It's not only historically accurate, but spiritually contagious. Jesus was teaching us how to become peacemakers, how to care for others. He taught us about being the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And in Acts, Luke writes about the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit after days of prayer and meditation. And I think this is a good time to talk about mindfulness. So spiritual mindfulness comes in the form of five things. Stillness, acceptance, flow, gifts, and meditation. Now, stillness is the first requirement to manifest your deep connection to God. Just as Jesus and the great prophets sought out silence, we need to seek out stillness. Stillness allows us to go beyond the turbulence of our own internal dialogue. And in stillness, there's no fear. There's no confusion. There's no compulsion to control. Oh, you guys don't have that problem? <laughs> Just me? Okay, well then, acceptance is embracing the present moment as is. Accepting uncertainty. Let's take a breath. <sighs> Acceptance allows us to seek things for others first. The intention of acceptance is not to create is excuse me. The intention of acceptance is to create happiness for the giver and the receiver. Accepting responsibility means not blaming anyone or anything for your situation, including yourself. Flow happens when your inner self is still and you are independent of the moment. Now, I've also experienced a moment of spiritual flow when I wasn't in meditation. A few days before Brad's passing, when we knew the end was near, we grieved and we mourned together. I actually think that this experience I'm about to share with you is one of the reasons that my healing came, came quickly, not that I'm healed, but my journey of healing came quickly, more quickly than I expected because I got to experience grief with my husband. And so a few days before his passing, Brad sat in a chair and at our dining room and I stood next to him and we were holding each other. And his head was on my chest and his arms were around my waist and we just cried. We cried so hard. For a very long time, we cried. We were grieving the loss of our future grieving the loss of our children's future to never see their dad. We were both in a moment of breaking love. He was broken open to the idea of moving on to heaven and finding eternal love. And I was, I was broken to the gratitude I had in getting to love this man for two decades. So remember, I'm holding him and he is wet with my tears. His top of the head, his forehead, his face, just wet with my own tears. 
But get this, the top of my head and my forehead was completely drenched. How is this possible? Well, at that moment, that space of breaking love between a husband and a, a wife, I believe that Jesus held us both and shed his own tears of love, pouring out over the top of my head. And it was a moment of our earthly and our spiritual realms intersecting. Just as Jesus knew his purpose and his gifts, by you expressing your gifts, your talents, and fulfilling the needs of humans, you become carefree, you become joyful, and your life becomes an expression of unbounded love. Now, meditation is simply the practice of silence and non-judgment, even against yourself. There is no one way to meditate, but I like to have my hands open, my feet on the ground. I like to be seated, have my eyes closed, and I start by observing my breathing, the in and the out of my breaths. I slowly bring awareness to my heart, and I mentally ask myself, who am I? What do I want? What am I grateful for? What's my purpose? And how can I help others? When outside thoughts come to mind, I wish them joy and I let them go. And eventually, I just let all the thoughts go. And I sit still in silence, waiting to listen and hear from my Jesus. Now, I don't know if this exact practice would work for you, but I know that quiet stillness was the path that Jesus, was, Jesus chose. And there is dignity and there is wisdom to be found there. So my challenge for you is what is God calling you to see and hear about another reality? What is God calling you to see and to hear about another reality? All right, let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the people in this room, the comfort in this room, the joy that can come from this room. Our amazing worship band and our church leadership, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. You have brought us together to celebrate, to worship, and we ask that you inspire our hearts to be spiritually mindful of you that you help us to see your signs from the spiritual realm and you help us to interpret and you help us to find moments to be still and listen to you, Lord. And in that, we are grateful for the gifts that you've given us. Each of us, you've given us specific gifts. Inspire us to go out and seek for others first. Let us to help others before ourselves. Lord, I just want to thank you and say I love you in this space, in this time. I'm so happy to be where I am today because of you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.